At 23 minutes past one, on the morning of April the 26th, 1986, the world was seconds away from its worst ever nuclear accident. Reactor number four at the Chernobyl nuclear power station in the Soviet Union exploded. Five minutes later, a phone call, recorded at the time, was the first alert of a tragedy in the making. By morning, the physical devastation was revealed, but much worse was to come. The disaster at Chernobyl brought death and disease. It brought the very idea of nuclear power into question. And within the Soviet Union, the trauma of Chernobyl was so great that many see it as the first step in the breakup of the communist regime. This film tells the story, minute by minute, second by second, of the one hour countdown to tragedy. It's seen through the eyes of the key actors in the drama, the workers who were accidentally led to their deaths, and the innocent bystanders who looked on. Based on documented evidence and eyewitness reports, it has been filmed on location inside the surviving areas of the Chernobyl nuclear power station. The control room at Chernobyl's reactor number four. It is here that all the key decisions in the coming hour will be taken. The future of the reactor and the world beyond is in the hands of three men. At only 26, Leonid Toptunov is senior control engineer. His job is to control the enormous power in the reactor. 17. Alexander Akimov is the shift foreman, the captain of the ship. But tonight he is outranked. Deputy Chief Engineer Anatoly Dyatlov is in charge. Dyatlov is one of the Soviet Union's top nuclear engineers. He's also a hard man operating in a harsh system. There is a further vital character, the newly commissioned reactor number four itself, one of the communist regime's proudest technological achievements. Tonight, the control room is preparing for a safety test on the reactor. But a fateful argument is brewing between the two senior engineers and Dyatlov about the level of power at which it is safe to begin the test. On this night, Chernobyl is harboring two deadly secrets. The first is a potentially fatal flaw in the reactor's design, which the engineers are unaware of. A flaw that makes it highly unstable when run at low power. The second secret concerns the man in charge. Anatoly Dyatlov's own history is scarred by the very technology he is seeking to dominate. Tonight, Dyatlov and the reactor will face each other in a battle of strength that will destroy them both. Thirty-one minutes past midnight. The argument over the power level at which the safety test on Chernobyl's reactor number four can begin grows ever more serious. The test has been demanded by Russia's atomic energy authorities and stems from the Cold War fear of being attacked that still grips the Soviet Union. 
A few years before, the Israeli Air Force bombed an Iraqi nuclear reactor built by the Russians. Since then, Soviet scientists have demanded tests on their reactors to see what would happen if they came under enemy attack and their power supply was knocked out. But Deputy Chief Engineer Anatoly Dyatlov is deliberately ignoring top-level advice on how the test should be done. The guidelines state that the reactor's power should be between 700 and 1,000 megawatts when the test begins. Dyatlov wants to do the test at only 200 megawatts to preserve the cooling water that stops the reactor overheating. He believes there is little risk. Unfortunately, that night, there was not a single man in the control room that he saw as his equal. There really wasn't anyone there who was as strong a character or as professionally qualified whose opinion he would respect. Dyatlov is not in fact an unreasonable man. Rather, he is a creature of the communist system that has raised and promoted him. He was born a fisherman's son in Siberia and ran away from home at the age of 14. He's overcome these unpromising beginnings to rise through the ranks as an engineer. He is a party man who tries to follow the rule book. But he's aware that in the nuclear industry, the rule book and reality often don't match. To get things done, shortcuts and improvisation are sometimes the only answer. Winding the power down has led to it dropping too fast. One mile away from Chernobyl is the dormitory town of Pripyat. Everyone who lives here works at the power station. Though they don't know it, all these people's destinies will be dictated by the events unfolding in control room number four. Among them, soundly asleep, is Nikolai Fomin, the chief engineer of Chernobyl, who left the order for the safety test to be carried out. A few hundred yards away, Natasha Yevchenko is being kept awake by her two-year-old son, Kiro. From her window, Natasha can see the lights of the nuclear power station where her husband, engineer Sasha Yevchenko, is working a routine night shift. As he passes through the kilometer-long turbine hall, Sasha's thinking not of work, but of the upcoming May Day holidays. There was something about that night, something unusual. For some reason, I got all dressed up. The weather was remarkable, very warm for spring. I went off to work in a terrific mood. But my wife said that all night, our son Kirill was crying. She didn't sleep a wink. Others are also awake, among them two fishermen. One, a Chernobyl maintenance man, casting for fish, attracted by the power plant's warm wastewaters. Twenty-four minutes to one. A new problem disturbs the concentration of the increasingly fraught operators. Senior unit control engineer Boris Stolyarchuk controls the flow of water through the reactor. He's all too used to alarms like this. 
As for the water levels in the separator drums, it was always difficult to control them at low power. All the operators knew about it, so I didn't feel afraid. Then... Twenty-two minutes to one. The reactor has ground to a complete halt. Dyatlov makes a fateful decision. To raise power after coal 30, the shift actually had to pull all the control rods out of the reactor. This was like cocking a gun. Control rods are the accelerator and the brakes of the nuclear reactor. Below the 50-foot reactor lid are 1,661 uranium-filled fuel rods, which descend into the reactor's core. The splitting of the uranium atoms releases enormous heat from the fuel rods, which turns water into steam. The steam drives the giant turbine, which generates electricity. To control this power, 211 boron control rods are spread throughout the reactor's core. If they're raised, power accelerates. If they're taken out altogether, the engineers lose their ability to apply the brakes. Yet that is exactly what Dyatlov tells his men to do. The men's revolt has failed. Tregov and Akimov power up the reactor. Within five minutes, they've got power rising again. The Atlov has what he wants. Не удалось поднять мощность реактора до 160 мегаватт. Ладно, передай управление Топтунов. Вперед. Не уходи, постой с ним рядом. The control room staff have every reason to fall in line. To be a nuclear engineer is a prestigious and well-paid job. They and their families live in the company town of Pripyat. The shops are well stocked. There's a new school and amusement park. Nobody wanted to lose the job because losing the job would mean losing the flat in Pripyat and, 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 and going elsewhere to some, probably some ghastly outpost in Siberia. The fear of getting sacked was the reason why they didn't speak out more effectively when they realized that they were doing something that could be very dangerous. Eight minutes to one, another alarm. No one outside the control room knows about the argument going on there. For workers like Sasha Yevchenko, it's just another ordinary night. There were no specific assignments for the shift. I'd already done one shift, and we all thought the reactor had been shut down. I thought the test had been done on the earlier shift. Outside the plant, the night is still.
three minutes past one. After the failed revolt, the control room is now calm too. The men have got the reactor's power to the level Deputy Chief Engineer Dyatlov wanted for the test. Anatoliy Stepanch, we have come to power in 200 megawatts. That's good. Start the test. According to the regulations, start the test. I can only use the power of 700 megawatts. If you want to perform the test at a level of power of 200 megawatts, I ask you to take this instruction to the operating journal. Да будет вам известно, что как заместитель главного инженера я имею полномочия изменить параметры проведения испытаний. И я ими воспользуюсь. Продолжайте испытания. In the pump room, mechanic Valery Kadanchuk is visited by his friend, foreman Valery Perovichenko. Kadenchuk has less than 20 minutes to live. Next on Pervichenko's rounds is Sasha Yevchenko in the maintenance department. An innocent request will lead them back to the pump room near the reactor's core. <laughs> The water shortage continues to set off alarms, but still none of these engineers believes a serious accident is possible. For the top man, Nikolai Fomin, it's simply inconceivable. Fomin had done a correspondence course in nuclear engineering, but he wasn't an expert in the field at all. He had risen mainly because of his standing as the party secretary. Unlike Dyatlov, who was aware that there were dangers in these reactors, Fermin believed everything he'd read, and so when the issue of safety arose, he'd say, well, the chances of an accident are completely remote, about as remote as you being hit by a meteorite. Even the safety-conscious Alexander Akimov, who does understand the technology, has officially estimated the chances of an accident at Chernobyl as one in 10 million per year. But Akimov and his colleagues do not know the reactor as well as they think. They are the victims of years of cover-up and negligence. Рабочими буднями стала для нас и одна из республиканских целевых программ энергокомплекс. From the 1960s, the expansion of nuclear power has been a key target of the communist regime. Nothing has been allowed to get in the way not even the KGB. These recently released KGB documents show the authorities ignored repeated warnings between 1979 and 86 that Chernobyl had serious design flaws. Chernobyl's director, Viktor Bokhanov, and his senior managers rushed to get reactor number four open early so that they and their party bosses could win substantial bonuses. Safety came second. Bukhanov, the director of the whole power station complex, was always at his wit's end to meet deadlines to build these reactors. For example, the roof of the reactors was meant to have been built with fireproof materials, but these fireproof materials didn't exist. The roof had to be put on, so he used combustible materials. Accidents were common and hushed up. The very test being done on this night should have been carried out before reactor number four was even opened. Now, at Chernobyl, all these chickens are coming home to roost. Something deadly serious is happening in the reactor's core, 
that no one in the control room is aware of. The few boron control rods still in the reactor are only partially inserted at the top, so power is building into a hotspot at the bottom of the core where the sensors don't always detect it. The reactor is now an invisible ticking time bomb. Twelve minutes past one. The growing pressure inside Chernobyl's reactor number four is matched by the pressure within the man controlling the night's events. Deputy Chief Engineer Anatoly Dyatlov. Dyatlov remains determined to push through the safety test, despite the opposition in the control room. One reason may be power station politics. Dyatlov is in trouble with the local Communist Party for being rude to his workers. His boss, Nikolai Foman, is due for promotion. A successful test could help Dyatlov get Foman's job and remove him from the engineers on the shop floor. But Dyatlov also holds a darker, more personal secret. Back in the 1960s, he'd worked in Siberia, installing nuclear reactors into submarines. There was a nuclear accident. The investigation found that it happened as a result of Dyatlov's actions, though it was not shown to be his fault. Dyatlov was exposed to 200 rem, three lifetimes worth of radiation. Soon after the Siberian accident, Dyatlov's son died of leukemia, the most common disease children get from exposure to radiation. It is said the tragedy changed him made him more driven, more willful. Tonight, his will is set against the very nuclear power that may have taken his child. One seventeen a.m., less than six minutes to the start of the safety test. The Atlov is confident. But the hot spot continues to build unseen at the bottom of the core. Еще две минуты и все. Шевелитесь, шевелитесь. Outside the control room, life and gossip carry on as normal. Тогда, наверное, надо оставить эти разговоры. А то <смех> сибирские комары загрызут. <смех> да. Про сигарету. Жена звонит. <смех> да. Да, хорошо, сейчас буду. Держи. Вернусь до курил. Дятла вызывай их срочно. Смотри, чтоб дятел не закрыл. А он таки заклюет. Перевиченко's route to the control room will lead him past the reactor. Ну, ежели наконец все готовы, может мы начнем испытание? Запишите все параметры испытания турбогенератора. Мы начинаем. Это Саша, ты не прав. Тишки это прекрасно. Смотри. 
может для тебя прекрасно, а для меня пока рано. Я пока об этом не думаю. Зря. А мы вот думаем. Второго уж думаем. Включить два резервных насоса. Включить два резервных насоса. Резервные насосы включены. Хорошо. Ну что, Александр Федорович, начнем испытать. The test will shut off the power to the massive turbine and let it coast. Backup diesel generators will take over. But there's a 40-second gap before they kick in. The question is how effectively the slowing turbine will keep the water pumps going until the diesel generators take over. Without that water, the reactor could boil dry like an immense kettle. But to Dyatlov, who continues to have no idea of the hotspot that has already built up, the risk remains purely theoretical. The power to the turbine is turned off. Over the next minute, a terrifying chain of parallel events will unfold. As the turbine winds down, the pumps push less water through the reactor's core. More and more steam is generated from less and less water. Steam pressure builds at the core's invisible hotspot with every passing second. As the steam pressure rises, it spreads to the pump room. Perofichenko enters the huge reactor hall directly above the reactor's lid to see something never witnessed before. Steam pressure inside the core is lifting the 350 kilo caps to the fuel rods out of their sockets. Pressing the emergency AZ-5 button automatically lowers the ball and control rods to reduce power, but it has an unforeseen and fatal effect. The boron rods were in fact tipped with graphite, and that short moment when they are first inserted into the reactor, the graphite in fact leads to a surge in the power, not a reduction of power. From when the AZ-5 button was pushed until the explosion, the power increased hundreds of times.
Реактивность удваивается каждую секунду. Это невозможно. Уровень мощности превысил 530 мегаватт. Наконец, Сити сливает с крышки реактора. Ребята! Ребята! Люди! Котик дома. Котик. Интересно. А кто The disaster is now seconds away. Steam pressure at the reactor's hot spot can't be contained. 50 control and fuel rod shafts are torn apart. Power rockets, turning the whole reactor into a volcanic steam pressure cooker. Никто не знает. Почему света? Скорее, 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 посмотрите все. Посмотрите на пульт. Что показывают дачи? После первого взрыва я... After the first explosion, I thought the problem was a hydraulic blast in the de-aerators. Хотел побежать... I wanted to try to switch the setting to compensate, but then the second explosion happened. Ног прогремел второй взрыв. Буквально там через... Seconds after the first blast, we heard the second, a massive explosion. I didn't know what it was. We only felt the blast wave. It smashed my door. With the 500-ton safety cap blown off and air being sucked in below, the reactor becomes a giant blowtorch, blasting 50 tons of nuclear fuel into the atmosphere, 10 times Hiroshima. 700 tons of radioactive graphite are blown around the plant. Clouds of dust are sucked into the control room, accompanied by a strange smell. Gases released from the core leave a metallic taste, like ozone after a thunderstorm. It is, in fact, the stench of death. The dust is the cloak of the invisible killer of radiation. The control room operators are far enough away from the reactor's core to survive the explosion. But some will wish they had not. Many will face days, weeks, even years of agony as radiation burns them to death from the inside. <coughs> what struck me was what had happened to my wall. It's cast concrete, a meter thick. I saw it in the corner of my room, bending, as if it was made of rubber, like this. It got dark immediately. The lights went out. Steam wrapped around everything. Dust steam, darkness, and a horrible hissing noise. I thought it could be an earthquake or maybe war. The reactor was the last thing on my mind. Come on, 
Помоги! Это был мой оператор, Виктор Дегтяренко. That was my operator, Viktor Dektorenko. I only recognized him by his voice. His face was burnt, all covered in blood. Viktor was still in shock. He said to me that he had been near the pumps together with Rusanovsky the second pump operator, and that he stayed there, and I should help them. When I reached him, he was shivering. You know, when a man is in shock, he just indicated with his hands and said, but what did I find? Ruins, that's all I saw. If he had been there, he would have been buried under the pillars. In place of the ceiling, there was only sky, a sky full of stars. At 3 a.m. I was vomiting violently. It was the first sign of radiation sickness. At 6 o'clock I couldn't even get to the first aid post by myself. They helped me there, put me in an ambulance and took me to the medical station. Sasha Yevchenko will survive. Others are dying. The radioactivity pours out of the reactor to be blown across Belarusia towards the heart of Europe. The real nightmare is still to come. By the morning of April the 26th, the KGB was filming the devastated scene of the worst nuclear accident in history. Whoever shot this declassified KGB footage absorbed a massive dose of radiation. The next day, the people of Pripyat were officially told the worst. The following night I was taken to Moscow by plane. Only five people survived from those who were on board. Then my family was evacuated with the entire city. It would take a full week for all 135,000 people to be evacuated. The radiation count was so high, the flashes from it burned straight onto this film. A 30 kilometer zone of exclusion was declared. A zone frozen in time like a modern Pompeii.
over 600,000 Soviet men and women were brought in to contain the radioactivity. They worked in hellish, often chaotic conditions with extraordinary bravery in order to safeguard the rest of the world. Many of them had no protective clothing whatsoever. Everything they touched burned with radioactivity. The poisonous clouds spread beyond borders across much of the Northern Hemisphere. Washed into the earth by the rain, the radioactive dust lives on in plants, animals, and human beings. Within the Soviet Union, in the changing times of a new openness, the political effect was profound. I think in both a, a symbolic and a very real way, Chernobyl was the beginning of the end for the Soviet Union. I think in a symbolic way, the sort of meltdown, the explosion, was caused by all the inherent contradictions in the Soviet system. And therefore, it's, it's, it's a very good paradigm, if you like, a symbol of, 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 of what was to happen. Chernobyl's death toll, though horrifying, has turned out to be smaller than many first feared. The scientific consensus is that it will cause some 10,000 cancers in Russia and 25,000 worldwide over a 70-year period. As yet, the only proven rise in disease is in thyroid cancers in children. It is in individual human lives that the cost is most visible. The fishermen spent the night watching the firemen fight the radioactive blaze until they started to feel ill. Within hours, their skin went black, a nuclear tan that foreshadowed their deaths. Thirty workers, including fire crew on the site, died from acute radiation poisoning. Valera Kademchuk was vaporized in the explosion while at his post in the pump room. Valery Perevichenko died six weeks later of radiation burns, suffered trying to find his friend Kademchuk. Alexander Akimov died 15 days after the explosion from radiation poisoning. As long as he could speak, he said, I did everything right. I don't understand why it happened. Leonid Toptinov died three days after Akimov. He too protested his innocence to the grave, saying he'd done everything he could. The chief engineer of Chernobyl, Nikolai Fomin was sentenced to 10 years hard labor, but was soon released due to a mental breakdown. He's now said to drift in and out of lucidity. Miraculously, Sasha Yevchenko survived, as did his wife Natasha and their son Kirill. But that night lives on in his memory and in his body. I had 15 skin graft operations in the first year. The burns didn't show themselves at once. They appeared after I got to the hospital in Moscow. They ripened. When I was in the recovery unit, my skin was all black. When they pulled back the sheets, my skin peeled off like Xerox powder. I have to be careful now. For instance, I can drive a car, but I can't do repairs. I can't touch petrol or oil. The wounds won't heal. The blood won't congeal properly. There are other things, but you get used to them. You just live with it. You have to. Anatoly Dyatlov received a massive 390 rem of radiation. But even this five lifetimes worth of radiation didn't kill him. He lived on till 1995, 
when he died of a heart attack. Dyatlov served four years of his 10-year sentence, and in a remarkable interview given shortly before he died, he argued that in the battle between himself and the reactor, only one side could be blamed. The reactor shouldn't have been in operation. The real blame lies with the atomic energy authorities. Not having the correct documentation when and where it was needed made the explosion of the reactor inevitable. The reactor marched straight to its doom. 